please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Monty Hamilton. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Somali, and um, thank you, Georgia Tech, um, and very special thanks to Terry Blum for inviting me to come over and talk today. I have to um, admit, last week I snuck in here and listened to the speaker and kind of to see what the audience was and, and frankly to learn what I had said yes to several months ago to Terry. Um, and then I went online and did some research and looked at the archives of uh, videos of speakers that you've had here, and it's amazing. I, I know some of you are um, encouraged to come to this because of your classwork, uh, but I would encourage you to look at that list of speakers in the future, not, maybe not necessarily today. Um, and look to see who is here because it's an amazing lineup that you will not have the opportunity to listen or hear from CEOs like Bill Nudy uh, in this kind of intimate setting. So I'd encourage you to take every advantage of that as you could. I would also encourage you, uh, if you don't know Terry Blum, to introduce yourself. Uh, in addition to getting me to come up and speak today, uh, Terry's in charge of the Inclusion Post-Secondary Academy here at Georgia Tech. Yes, hand for that. Thank you. Uh, and, and go online and take a look at it or talk to Terry. What I will tell you as father of two special needs kids uh, is that whatever you can volunteer or help Terry out with, you will get repaid tenfold uh, just in terms of what you get out of that program. So I'd encourage you to get involved with that. Um, I, I also uh, want to thank um, Alan Flory over here to my left. Uh, Alan was one of my early uh, mentors and uh, he doesn't like to use the term, but bosses, frankly, uh, when I was at Accenture. I did leave Accenture, just note that. Um, and and I, I also just want to quickly say that um, I, I took a little bit of prerogative today. Uh, as a tech CEO, I wore my jeans. Uh, I didn't put on the suit normally, and nor did I, Alan, do what I had to do when I worked for you, which was I could either wear a blue shirt or a white shirt, and that was the choices. And if I happened to ever get up from my desk, I had to put my jacket on, even if I was just going down to the bathroom down the hallway. So, so times have changed, I think, for the better. That's right. <laughs> I'm still a little conflicted, to be honest with you. Um, but it's funny when you, when you think about these things and, and you shine the uh, light of the present and illuminate the past, often things seem a little illogical or silly. So keep that in mind as we go through the discussion today. So I've got three parts to the discussion today I want to talk to you about. I've got um, the first part, which will give you a little bit of insights and, uh, into my background and where I've come from. Uh, second part, a little bit of my professional journey to get to where I am today here. Uh, and our offices, when I say here, my office is literally just across the street at the Biltmore Building. And then the third part is to uh, talk about the aspects of building uh, a purpose-driven company and what that means uh, and hopefully that'll lead to some questions at the end of which I've left on a 20-25 minutes for you guys to ask as many questions as you can stand to hear my answers from. So uh, I, I, I did say I, I would give you initially some uh, uh, insight into uh, my background and um, where I've come from uh, but before I do that I do want to give you a little bit since RSI and it'll be easier if I call it RSI rather than rural sourcing. We'll get through the presentation a lot quicker. Um, is not as big a brand name perhaps as Coca-Cola or NCR or Home Depot. So the tech guy can't work the uh, clicker. There we go. Now we're good. So part of uh, building a purpose-driven companies is uh, to ask yourself why. Why do you do what you do? Uh, and, and what difference does it make in the world? Um, and I think rather than me telling you about rural sourcing, uh, it may be more helpful to see a short video here that aired on the BBC back in February of this year that talked a little bit about our model and what we're doing. Many companies across the United States say they're bringing jobs back from overseas. So as wages rise across the world, Natalia Antaleva investigates whether the tide's turning on one of the biggest trends in globalization. In 
today's world, manufacturing is no longer just about making washing machines or candles. It's also about making software applications. From ordering a cap to paying bills, as we rely on technology more and more, we're also relying more on people who build it. Those people used to be mostly overseas. And it just signed a lease with uh... Monty Hamilton says they can be found instead in rural America. I mean, companies are going to look for cheaper ways to manufacture things, for less expensive ways to get things done. That's part of being in business. Uh, and we're offering them an alternative suddenly that nobody can say that's a bad thing, right? Because we are creating jobs here in the U.S. Uh, we can do it as cost effectively as they do it in India. Small towns near lesser known universities that's where rural sourcing sets up its software development centers. The low cost of living and labor here allows the company to compete with Indian prices. It used to be a matter of the economies of scale, right? Today, our clients are looking for economies of skill. So in order to develop a mobile application, I don't need hundreds of people. I need 10 really good ones who are going to go out there, understand the business problem, and quickly develop a solution to fix that problem. Um, and so what the market is demanding is changing dramatically. Rural sourcing is growing. They're about to open their fourth center. Among their clients are big names in insurance, retail, and IT industries. Most of them used to get their work done in India. So what is it like to be on the receiving end of America's reshoring efforts? On the record, industry leaders insist they haven't felt the effects of reshoring. They also dismiss the trend because they say, on a large scale, jobs simply have nowhere to go. In fact, I've seen this industry from 1994. I heard the same story about reshoring for the last 15 years. I heard the same story about India becoming uncompetitive. I heard the same story about uh, you know, work going away and the companies being at the mercy of uh, somebody else. I don't know, but I've been hearing it, the same story told again and again and again and again. And I don't think the jobs are going to go back because I think people are making too much of it. The U.S. is just not producing enough people in computer science and in technology the way India is and the uh, way the U.S. industry uh, needs people. So I don't think it's a matter for worry because uh, the ship has left the shores long ago and it's not going to sail back very soon. Made in America is no longer just a slogan. It's the new mindset, and for more and more people here, a way of making America competitive again. Okay, so that's a little bit of a quick intro background into rural sourcing, our model, and, and what we're trying to do in the world today. Um, and as promised, I want to give you a little bit of background of uh, where I've come from and some of my personal history and I think it'll, um, sorry, you'll see how it ties in to building a purpose-driven company. Um, I was uh, born right here. This is my hometown. This uh, is uh, one of the two stoplights in that hometown. It's a town of about 5,000 people stuck in the foothills in the backwoods of northeast Mississippi. Uh, so a, a tiny small place. Um, and so the idea of bringing jobs to places, well, we don't locate in towns this small, but opportunities to places like this um, was very intriguing for me. But one of the several things I learned about myself and, and growing up in a small town like this, and uh, my parents were great, uh, loved my sisters and I very much, um, but hard workers. So didn't come from a whole lot. Mom was a nurse, father was a truck driver, uh, worked, lived paycheck to paycheck. Um, and encourage us to get out and do our own work as well. So uh, doing your regular chores of cutting the grass, uh, cleaning your room, working half a day in the garden, picking uh, strawberries and potatoes and all those stuff, uh, that was kind of table stakes. That's why you got to live and eat at their house, right? Uh, if you wanted to get real money, then you had to go out and get a job. And so very early on, I, I started working. I started selling newspaper, uh, magazine subscriptions, uh, I had a newspaper route, uh, actually with my grandmother, get in at 5 a.m., and she would drive me around and I would throw the papers out. Uh, I worked in her store later on, uh, and she was a real entrepreneur, and she kept creating businesses and businesses, and so I, I think part, partly so I could have a job. 
But some of the things I learned about myself that have made me what I am today and a part of my DNA, whether good or bad, uh, is growing up in a place like that and understanding the value of hard work, what it means. I also learned about myself that I was very competitive. Uh, I had a competitive streak. I played all sorts of sports in high school. Um, and as um, Mr. Flurry pointed out earlier as well to me, uh, that I'm a little bit impatient, uh, which is true. I'm guilty of that. That was not one I had put, put in my slide deck, though. Um, and that, those things served me well. So I, after high school, I uh, went on, as most people do, kind of, of uh, where I came from. I uh, went to junior college first. I actually uh, got to play football on Saturdays. Um, and what I also learned about myself was that uh, if any of you out there heard the kind of some commentators talk about players when they're deceptively fast, right, which means they're faster than they, they actually look. Well, I was deceptively slow. I was slower than I looked. Um, <laughs> but what I learned is that I could catch. Because catching was repetitions, right? Catching was working with the quarterback over and over and over again on your routes, and where to get your hands and the timing and all those things. So I learned I could do that. Also didn't hurt that he was my roommate. Um, so I spent a lot of time figuring that out because I could outwork the next guy to get that position. Um, I went on from there and went to a small Division III school in Jackson, Mississippi called Millsaps College. Uh, very well regarded academic school. Uh, not so well regarded football program, which is why, again, I got to play football for a couple more years. Uh, but in the process, I also got a great education. My first job out of uh, undergrad was actually in sales. And I went about uh, selling my school, Millsaps College. I worked in the admissions office. Uh, my territory was uh, Georgia, anything basically east of Mississippi. So if you want to talk about a challenge, Try coming to Atlanta and visiting the private schools here and the public schools here and convincing them that they could come to Mississippi, of all places, and get a really good, really expensive liberal arts education. That's the toughest job I've ever had. That was not an easy sale, mind you. But I did. I got some folks to come over there, and it worked out well. And I learned a lot in that process, especially about selling intangible goods. Um, I eventually went, uh, after three years there, I went to SMU for business school and um, uh, realized there, uh, as I had in all these steps along my, my path at that point in time, um, that each one I took seemed to get more and more competitive. And I had to do something to make sure that I stayed competitive with that group I was with. So my first, I had a partial scholarship and a working um, program at SMU, and my first job was to go through all the resumes and applications of my um, fellow students. Because SMU had a mentoring program where you could go and out of 100 mentors in the Dallas business community, um, give us your top one, two, and three, and we would match you up with those. And that was my first job. So I got to know all the intimate details about my classmates. And as I started reading through those applications, I realized now that here's this redneck from rural Mississippi in classes with um, folks from Harvard, and Princeton, and Yale. And I was scared to death. I was startling to wonder how in the world will I compete with this, right? I don't have the background to do this. I don't have the raw potential to do this. Um, but I kind of fell back to what I knew, which is work hard. And I dare say that there's probably no one in my classmates that spent as much time in those two buildings on the SMU campus where the business school is than I did. Um, and it worked out well. Uh, from there, I had a buddy who I'd played football with at Millsaps who was working here in Atlanta. Happened to be working for a company called Anderson Consulting. Most of you now know that as Accenture. He called and said, what are you going to do when you graduate? So I'm not sure. I'm bouncing around different job interviews here in Dallas. Uh, I've got a few, couple of offers, not really that excited about them. Um, and he said, well, why don't you come over to Atlanta and interview with um, Accenture? I said, great, what do you do? Right? I had no clue. He said, we travel a lot, we work a lot, we play a lot. I said, sounds good to me, I'll come over. <laughs> so I, uh, I get on a plane, and uh, they're willing to fly me out to Atlanta from Dallas. I'm 26 or 27 years old at this time. First plane flight ever. I'd never been on a plane before. And I didn't let Accenture know that. I was a redneck from rural Mississippi, right? 
Um, and I learned to fake it until I make it, right? Uh, but I got on that plane, I came out here, they put me up at the Ritz Carlton, fed me dinner, fed me lunch the next day, I was sold. Right. All I can think about is, God, if they give me an offer, I'm signing it on the spot. No negotiations. I'm here. And they did. Somehow I, I worked my way through that. Now, they are not, at that point in time, hiring a lot of MBAs, and they didn't really know what to do necessarily with MBAs in their program. They hired a lot of smart people like you all, sent them to St. Charles, Illinois, put them through programming classes, taught them how to break big rocks down into little rocks. Meanwhile, I had been learning to become a COO or a CFO or even a CEO. And they put me in St. Charles and asked me to do programming in a language that most of you have never heard of called COBOL. Um, well, I sucked. I am absolutely, Alan will probably agree with this, the worst programmer that Accenture ever hired over the years they've been, and they've hired a lot. Fortunately for me, uh, this thing called business process reengineering came along and they said, hey, Monty, we think you might be better doing this kind of soft skill stuff rather than these uh, programming languages uh, and I was absolutely delighted to get out of programming. I was really bad. So it's ironic now that I run a company that we do programming work. Um, but that was kind of my career up until that, uh, up until that point. Uh, and I give you all that to, just to give you some kind of level set here because um, I thought A, there might be some interest in knowing where I've come from. Uh, B, I felt a little bit guilty because I've, I've had the um, Yik Yak app for the last uh, several semesters, so I know a lot about you guys. <laughs> More than I probably care to, really, frankly. Um, but you are, you are funny and you get my day started off with a great nice smile. So um, after Accenture, um, I got to the point where I felt like I could make it there. I felt like I knew the next steps and the path to get to the partnership. And once I felt in my head that I could get there, maybe the other partners didn't agree with that, but at least in my head I thought I could get there, um, that box was checked for me. I didn't like being a small fish in a big pond. And so once I had that box checked on my ego, um, as uh, Shamali said earlier, uh, four other guys, myself, left Accenture to start a company called Clarkston Consulting. We grew that business to about an $80 million business. Uh, it's, it's still around today. I'm still a shareholder, but I'm no longer involved with them. Um, we had offices all over the U.S., um, one in Europe, one in Latin America. And so, by all rights, fairly successful company. And it was a little Accenture, if you will, basically, because that's where we all had worked. That's where we all came from. So our model was based off of what Accenture did and how they did things, um, with a few things that we, we tweaked and changed. But frankly, after... 12 or 13 years of doing that, I got to a point where other partners were working for me um, and I felt like I was doing nothing more than kind of counting their successes and what they were doing and how much revenue they were bringing in and how much they were building clients. And I got bored. And so I started looking around for the next opportunity. I needed the next uh, thing to fix. I needed the next thing to start. And so I started looking around and was very open with the founding partner and, and uh, talked to him about it. And then um, I realized something that we had uh, done. Uh, we had bought a, had actually taken a small minority interest in the company. And um, before I get into that, let me just ask a question here, a little audience participation. Anybody recognize this picture at all? I'm going to say no. Anybody ever heard of Led Zeppelin? A few hands, a few hands, all right, good. So, Zepp's a pretty good band, right? So back when uh, the music industry, when you actually made albums and sold entire albums, artwork was a big part of those albums being released. Um, Zeppelin's last album they did, uh, or of new work anyway, was called In Through the Outdoor. And I say all that and get this picture up there because that's what I felt like I did. So I didn't really leave the Clarkston family. We had bought or taken a minority interest in a company called Rural Sourcing that was based in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So I'm not the founder. Uh, we took a 40% 40 40 stake in 2007, uh, kind of began to work with them, thought we could bring them, their folks, onto our projects and, and get some leverage that way. Um, was pretty rocky. A lot of the partners didn't know why we had spent the money to do that. Wasn't going all that well. Uh, as I said, I was at a point where I was relatively bored. 
um, and decided that um, this might be interesting, right? Again, going back to my background, um, taking a look at what they were doing, uh, thinking about how we could do it better, maybe differently, position a little differently. And so I began to talk to the folks that work there, use them on a couple of my projects, got interested in what they were doing. Um, and then as I thought about what was driving me, what was my motivator, uh, while the uh, outside skin on, on this rural sourcing company at the time was not all that attractive, I absolutely fell in love with the model and the concept. And the concept of bringing thousands of jobs to the U.S., technology jobs where they wouldn't otherwise be. And so that was interesting, that was motivating for me, and that was my why I wanted to do that. And uh, many of you have heard, I'm sure, of uh, Simon Sinek, have you? Anyone seen maybe the video? Uh, I want you to take a listen to what Simon, and this is like a two minute clip here of what uh, Simon says about the, the question of why. Not what you do or how you do something, but the why of what you do. Uh, if you, if you, if you um, hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people to believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, when you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people are thinking the same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions, or the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel <coughs> Pierpont a few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright Brothers team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it would change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright Brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright Brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. <coughs> He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. He quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe you. Cool. Well, one of the things that um, Simon said at the very beginning is something that he said it much more eloquently than I have over the years, but I've tried to do this uh, in interviewing candidates for jobs. They spend the first half trying to figure out, make sure they got the requisite skills and experiences that we're looking for and that they could do the job adequately. In the second half, trying to figure out what their motivator is. Why do they want to do it? Why do they want to come work here? Do they believe, as he said, what I believe in and what we, we have a mission to do? Uh, and it will tell you that over the years, we've been very successful uh, when we are able to get what I've termed the head and the heart. 
Because if I get both of those things in one person, they and we will be successful. So uh, I want to give you a little context for RSI now and the timing of, uh, of this thing. So um, I realize that many of you in late 2008, early 2009 were in high school, grade school maybe, uh, middle school. Anybody know what was going on in late 2008, 2009? Yes, sir. Bad stuff. Bad stuff. The Great Recession. <laughs> it was. It was very well put. Uh, these are some of the headlines from that period of time. So during that period of time, the stock market lost over half its value. During that period of time, 8 million Americans lost their jobs. During that same period of time, 4 million houses were foreclosed upon and the families kicked to the streets. And there were 2.5 million businesses that shuttered and closed and never opened again. Now, the government did support some of the businesses, the ones that were too big to fail, right? AIG um, and others. Uh, but many of those small and mid-sized businesses closed their doors and still have not opened them back up. So it was a tough time. It was difficult, right? Um, and this was the time when um, I decided that it would be the perfect time to do what I did. And this was uh, further proof of the times. So this picture was on the front of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in September of 2009. And you can see folks there dressed in their interview garbs, their suits, both men and women, standing in the Atlanta heat in September for five hours, hoping to get inside in the air conditioning where they might get a shot at an interview that might Odds not so good, but might lead to a job. So this was the time. So I decided, being the smart guy that I was, that this was the perfect time for me to, to cut two-thirds of my salary, leave that with Clarkson, Clarkston, to go off and take over a business that had lost close to a million dollars, and then try to reposition RSI as an alternative to the huge offshore companies like Quipro and Cognizant and others. So that's how smart I was. This was going on, and I thought, hey, what, well, let's, let's give this a shot. But the reality is it was the perfect time to do this um, because of what we were trying to do and because of trying to create jobs where there were none in the technology space. Uh, it did turn out to be a very good time. And so we got lucky, frankly. And I don't know, have any of you ever uh, seen this book or heard of this book, Blue Ocean Strategy? Um, it was written in 2005, it came out and published in 2005. I read it in 2009 after I decided to do this, not before. But as I read it, I began to get um, an idea of how we really could position the company for success into a blue ocean. And the strategy here of blue ocean is one of, instead of creating a company and going after the same customers with the same products, maybe at a different price point or with a few more features that everybody else is going after, if you're starting something new, why not create a new category, a new blue ocean that you can swim in and swim in alone? And so in the book, it talks about such business examples as um, uh, Yellowtail Wine, which positioned itself as an alternative not to be confused with very well-aged and uh, high-cost premium wines, but to be more compared with beers. So folks who had grown out of drinking beer decided that, hey, I can now afford a yellowtail wine. It looks very approachable. It's easy. We can do that. Very, very successful. Another one was Cirque du Soleil. So the circus uh, uh, revenues as an industry were going horrible, right? So Ringling Brothers, others in that business were not doing very well. Cirque du Soleil came out and said, we're not going to be in that business. We'll have that name, but we're going to be more of an entertainment. We're also not going to be a Broadway show, but some of what we do will look like that. We won't have animals running around looking like a circus, but we will have ringmasters and stuff. And so they created this whole new category for themselves. Similarly, at Rural Sourcing, what we've done is create a new category. So at the time, and still today to a large part, if you want computer software programming done, you have two options. One, if you need big scale and inexpensive labor, typically you go offshore, typically to India. 
or the Philippines. The other alternative is you hire uh, expensive on-site folks to come into your building, kind of disrupt your flow of things, talk to your people and take up their time and do programming on-site. And those are the two options. So at RSI, we decided we, there might be a better way. Let's do leverage the labor arbitrage available to us within the states and take these jobs to places where there are plenty of qualified talent, but it's just that that talent has chosen location over vocation. They're not willing to move to Silicon Valley or even to Atlanta or to Dallas. They want to live in Augusta, Georgia. They want to live in Mobile, Alabama. And that's where they're going to stay. And consequently, they've somewhat um, not risen to the full level of their talents. And so we come to those places and say, hey, guess what? You don't have to give up on vocation anymore. We'll bring the work to you. You can do work for Pfizer Pharmaceutical. You can build uh, an app, a mobile app for Game of Thrones for Turner here in town. And you can still stay in Augusta, Georgia and do all that work. And guess what? When you leave work at 5 o'clock or 5.30 or 6, you can be home in 10 minutes. You don't have to deal with the traffic I deal with. So it's kind of a win-win. We gave our clients an opportunity to get stuff done more efficiently, more effectively than they were experiencing offshore, uh, and at a much lower rate than what they were typically used to having to pay from the bigger consulting houses uh, here in the US. And so that's where we decided to plant our, our our flag and go after that space. Now since then there have been others who've created models that look similar, some different twists underneath the covers. Um, but it was nice in the fact that we went out there and created this whole category called domestic sourcing. And we've been reasonably successful at that. Um, we have not reached our mission. Our goal is to create thousands of US based technology jobs in places where they don't exist today. We've created hundreds. So we're well on our way, but we still have a long ways to go. We currently have three centers. Uh, I'm leaving on Sunday this week to go out to our fourth center, which will be announced on Monday with the governor of that state. Uh, so we're looking forward, very much looking forward to that. The um, other thing that I, I had a chance to do just recently as I was going over some of this stuff with our HR and recruiting team, and talking about our numbers, our fiscal year ends at the, this Friday. It's been a very good year. We've been 50%, over 50% growth year over year from prior year. Uh, so we talked about the number of people we hired, the amount of revenue that we've done, the growth, et cetera. And then I said, I, I want you guys to be very proud of that, and you should be very proud of accomplishments. But I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that you are here for the primary factor of changing people's lives. And as recruiters, some of what they get to do is there one story in particular. Um, there was a young woman uh, working in, who had grown up on the coast in Alabama, moved off to follow her dream and her job in, in DC, was working for a large Fortune 500 company there uh, in a technology leadership role. Her father became ill, <coughs> um, uh, had long been divorced from, from the mom, really had no one around in Mobile to, to look after him. He uh, came down, developed a case of diabetes. Um, and uh, as it would turn out, his health started progressing downhill very quickly. He wasn't taking care of himself. He wasn't watching his diet. He wasn't taking his medications. And so she picked up, left her job in D.C. and moved back to Mobile, Alabama to look after him with no idea that she would ever have a job there in what she wanted to work in, in the technology world. She opened up the uh, laptop one day and did a search and found out that we were looking for a technology leader just for the skill sets that she brought to the table. And so today her father is doing great. He is fantastic and she could never be happier with being near her father and having a job that she really wants to do in a place that she wants to live. Uh, so I remind our recruiters, you really do impact lives and you shouldn't lose sight of that. So uh, when I first started uh, talking about RSI and what we were doing, what we wanted to do, um, I'm sure many of the folks, I may need some more technical help here. There we go. Thought of me as the crazy one, because I remember, what do you do when you, you know, have a business you're trying to build? You go out and meet with all the people that you've done business with in the past, the friends that you have, the mentors that you have, and, 
you talk about what you're doing. And I dare say that probably the majority of those people looked at me like I had lost my marbles, right, of what I wanted to do. But sometimes, and this is a favorite quote of mine from Steve Jobs, it's the crazy ones who can, who can change the world. So with that, I am concluded my remarks and look forward to your questions. Okay. Hi. So you commented on the shorter commutes and making people happier as a result of it. So have you found that people are willing to work longer hours as a result of having the shorter commute because they're not having to lose that time? I would love that if they did. <laughs> and that's kind of the environment where I grew up with, with the Accenture and the Big Four consulting as you, you work whatever you're required to work. Um, and, and, and my model of what we built Clarkson on was very much the same thing. We pay people a lot of money, and we really don't want to hear a lot of complaining about how much you work. That's not the case now with RSI. People live in these places because they want the lifestyle. They want to show up at their daughter's volleyball game at 5.30. They don't want to miss that part of life. They don't want to get on planes and travel. They want to work and live in the same spot. And so we respect that. So rather than do what I used to do, which is suck it up and go, now we sit down and have intelligent conversations about how, how can we take that workload by throwing more people at it. And so occasionally they will, right? You always step up to the challenge if you have to. But we really try to put our colleagues first. So our business model is based on three simple C's. It's colleagues, clients, and community. Colleagues come first. That's, that's the resource that we don't have enough of, right? We can get enough clients. We're getting enough clients. We don't have enough colleagues. Uh, and so we really want to take care of them. We want to make sure not that they're pampered, but they feel like they're listened to. And that's one of the secrets that we can recruit away when we move into these towns. So there's lots of good talent there. Some are coming directly out of school, some internship with us. It's a, we have a robust internship program. Um, but many others are um, mid, senior level in their careers. But we're able to go into these places like Augusta and Mobile and pull them out of jobs that may not be all that exciting. So when you're working IT, um, typically, not all companies, don't want to offend anyone, or certainly not offend any of our clients, uh, but when you're working IT internally at a company who sells something else, your support mechanism. When you come work IT, technology development, software development in our shop, you're a profit center. You're how we make money. We treat you differently. We listen to what you have to say. You're the player on the field. You're not the concessionaire. And so we really think we do a good job of going in. And one of our um, core values <clears throat> is to be the employer of choice. So when we go to one of these locations, we want to make sure that we, and we outfit the building we're in in Augusta. We like older repurposed buildings. It's a 100-year-old mill building. It still smells like a cotton mill building, but it's beautiful. And it's got high 16-foot ceilings, the raw beams, exposed ductwork. Uh, ping pong table, foosball tables, Red Bull in the refrigerator, all the stuff that you would expect in a Silicon Valley software development shop is now in Augusta, right? Uh, and the people love it, right? They, they, they hang out after work to do games more probably than to work, uh, to answer your question. Uh, but that's what we want. That's the environment we want to create. Sure. Hey, Mr. Hamilton. Um, so I really loved how you were able to talk about how you were able to build a company that was purpose-driven, but in the same way you were able to tap into a part of a market um, in, a, in a new and innovative way. But I was wondering if you could touch on very quickly um, just some of the challenges that came with having to solve problems in different ways and to being able to um, go into a market that was potentially already saturated in the technology industry um, and be able to come up with something that was innovative. So some of the challenges associated with that. Sure. Well, uh, some of the challenges early on, the hurdles that had been thrown up over the years were, especially with the offshore companies, are you CMMI level certification, blah, 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 I have no idea what it means. The reality is it's a government standard, it doesn't mean anything, but it was a nice hurdle. We didn't really mess around with that. Anybody that wanted that, we just said, that's not what we do. Um, other hurdles that were real uh, was the hurdle of scale. 
So when you're selling to big companies, which most of our companies are Fortune 1000 or billion dollar private companies, um, they want to know how big you can get with them, should they need it, right, and if they need it. Uh, and for years, the large consulting firms, the offshore firms, uh, their models were built exactly on that. It was scale and cheap labor, right? And so clients got used to buying that way. So when I would go in and say, well, guess what? We've, we've got, you know, 30 people now in a Jonesboro, Arkansas. I'm like, yeah, okay. And uh, it wasn't really very compelling. And a quick story on how we came, overcame some of this stuff. Um, and, and as a, a startup, as an entrepreneur, as a struggling business, um, you get very creative, right? You have to get creative with no money. You have to figure out how to win clients and, and get confidence. Luckily, I had worked at big companies and I had clients in the past that trusted me and, and would give us some of that business. Um, but I have one of my clients, and I call them actually my early investor as opposed to my first big client, uh, because they, they did uh, do very well with us. Uh, but they um, decided they wanted to come out and see the center in Jonesboro. And so as a salesperson, you, you tend to stretch sometimes things of the numbers of people, and you look forward. I always say I could project like six months down the road. That's, you know, that's the number we'll be at. Um, so the CIO, who I did not know very well, and the director of IT who we were working for already, wanted to come out and see the center. And so to get, in order to get to Jonesboro, Arkansas, you fly into Memphis, and you drive about an hour and a half through the uh, delta of the northeast Arkansas. And so uh, I met them at the airport, and we started driving out. <clears throat> and um, I was really concerned about the image that we would go off, because at the time, uh, we were in an um, economic development building that was a tin building, a little roof on it we shared with three or four other companies. It's not very impressive. Um, and so every few minutes, I would lean forward from my back seat and say, hey, guys, just want to remind you, you know, we're a low-cost operation, so we don't put a lot of... Uh, marble and glamour and glass into our office buildings, right? You know, we try to keep the cost low, so be low for you. And they're like, yeah, we get it, Monty. Then I would lean forward a few more minute, miles down the road and say, just want to remind you, you know, we're very low cost. And, and they go, yeah, 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 we'll just shut up. We got it. We'll get there. So we get there, and I'm sweating bullets. I mean, you pull up, and there's fields on this side of our office building. There's a huge industrial welding operation on this side of our building. And we're in this small little tiny tin shack here. They pull up, the parking lot's flooded, there's about a dozen cars in the parking lot. Um, and prior to getting there, the uh, COO, who I really, my COO, who I could not have done this with, without, uh, who was coming from Boston every week and flying in and making sure the operations were getting up to speed. She'd gone out <clears throat> and brought in some temporary workers to fill up the cubes that we had in there and put them to work, now put them to work. Uh, so they were doing value-added stuff. So at least when the client came through, it didn't look like we were three-quarters empty. Um, now, that's been a great client of mine, and they know the story, so I've been full transparent with them. Uh, but but it, it, it goes to show that there are challenges early on, and especially ones of scale. Because clients want to know, hey, am I going to be safe with you, right? Um, and it's sometimes a little tough. We've gotten over that hurdle now. I don't get so many of those scale uh, questions anymore with over, you know, or, or we'll soon be 300 people here. Um, the other challenges are just around um, people's personal biases. So when I'd go to pitch my former clients in New York, Chicago, other places, hey, I've got this great solution for your software needs. I've got some people in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Like, really, Monty? Seriously? What, what kind of talent? are you going to get in Jonesboro, Arkansas? And so you'd have to help them overcome the fact that I remember to several of my New York buddies, I would say, look, I know you guys are special here in New York, but you really don't have a monopoly on intelligence. There are other intelligent lives outside the New York metro area. Um, and so we would bring them out, and eventually they'd meet the people and understand there is good intelligence out there. There's sharp, hardworking, smart people who can solve their problems through software technology. So, so that was a couple of the early on. Uh, funding is always a, an issue early on, right? Uh, especially in the services business. Um, there's about a 90-day gap between hiring someone and then getting eventually paid for that someone. That's assuming you've got good terms with your big clients. Uh, that doesn't always happen either. Um, and so cash flow is awfully important, and you have to make sure. We uh, were fortunate as early on as a part of Clarkston that they helped us in the cash flow area. Um, but that's all good now as well. 
Okay, sure. Can you talk a little bit about your personal leadership style and maybe how that has changed since going from a larger company like Accenture to now having like a your own but smaller company? Sure. Um, I would like to say I'm a, a, a softer, kinder Monty, but that's probably not true. Um, I, I am who I am, right? I think that's why I want to do some insights into my DNA and growing up where I did and some of the experiences I had. I think that those things mold you into what you become later on as a leader. Uh, I have been hugely, hugely fortunate, lucky in the people that I work with across the street. Um, my COO, as I mentioned, um, she got on a plane every week from Boston, flew into Jonesboro, and really whipped that team into shape and made it happen. Um, I think I, I uh, tend to enjoy working with people that um, are similar to me in terms of um, competitive, in terms of hardworking, and certainly in terms of believing in our mission. Um, so the COO is a former basketball player. Uh, my VP of HR rode crew at uh, West Virginia University. Um, so people who are naturally competitive and played team sports and get the idea of uh, what that means and what it entails, um, I enjoy being around those folks. Um, as far as leadership itself, you know, I, again, I, I'm the dumbest person in this room, I can tell you right now, because I could never get into the school here. Um, and, and so uh, I believe fully in hiring people smarter than I am. Uh, pointing them in the right direction, pointing them in the direction we'd like to go, um, and then staying out of their way as much as possible. I'm not a micromanager, it's not my deal. Uh, I do believe in um, painting visions for folks, setting goals out there that are stretch goals in some cases, um, and then encouraging people to, to get there, so. Most of uh, uh, the questions which I had have been uh, answered by you in your previous responses. But I have a different question for you. You initially mentioned that sometimes when you look in a flashback and you see that some things happened which were really silly. So um, can you tell us from your experience that uh, so some of the things which happened and they were really silly to you and they were hard to digest? And if they were, then what should we do to, you know, digest those. Yeah, it, I will say that it's tough in the moment. Because as I put this uh, presentation together, uh, and I looked back at what was truly going on in 2008, 2009, um, and had I sat down and put all those things on paper and looked at what was happening in the economy, <laughs> what was probably going to happen for the next several years, I would have never done this. It would not, I would not have reached a logical conclusion to go do this, to invest my own money, to go give up a bunch of salary and cushy job to go, to go do this thing. Uh, so it really was a gut decision, a, a, a heartfelt decision to go do something that I thought uh, needed to be done. Uh, but I think we often can shine the, the light of the present to illuminate the past and see that things that we do are you know, illogical in some cases. But the good news is they sometimes work out well, right? Um, and, uh, and, and it's not necessarily a wrong decision. Uh, but if I look back at some of the things that we've done that maybe were mistakes early on, uh, we partnered with a company and we didn't really do our due diligence. They didn't do so well on the engagement. We were supporting them and that kind of set us back probably a year in terms of our growth. Um, and so that was one where we probably should have followed our, our gut uh, that said this feels a little uh, queasy, doesn't look exactly right on the surface, but it was revenue. And it was revenue right there that seemed to be easy and we didn't have to go out and sell for it and it wasn't a long sales cycle. So we did it, we ended up getting burned by it. Um, so if, if there's any lesson out of that, I would say, you know, listen to your gut, do your due diligence. Um, not every deal is a good deal. So um, first off, thank you for your presentation. And second, uh, my question kind of has two parts. One, with your competitive personality, would you describe yourself as a serial entrepreneur? Like if you <laughs> see yourself getting bored with RSI and, and looking out in the future. And two, um, would you ever classify your competitive personality as a weakness in, in the business field? Insanity? Or I, thought, I thought you were going uh. <laughs> uh, to. So to the first question, serial entrepreneur, I, you know, 
I, I don't think that I am. So I stayed somewhere 12, 13 years before I came and, and did this thing. Um, I will tell you, though, that having done this now, um, I have two or three other ideas that I want to do as soon as this one gets to a point that someone else can take it over. Um, and so given that stuff, I, I would say maybe I do fall into that category. Uh, I'm fortunate, I'm blessed with a wife and a family that's supportive of that um, and allows me to leave great jobs at Accenture and go do something that's startup and, and then do it again 12 years later that seemed like a silly timing. Uh, in terms of weakness, sh sure. I mean, any, any strength I think can be turned into a weakness. Uh, and, and I will give you examples of probably the competitiveness, right? So sometimes you look at deals and you want to win that deal and you will do things in terms of cost cutting and other things that, you know, that might come back to bite me. And sometimes it does, right? So, but I hate to lose, right? <laughs> I don't like to lose. And, and, and I remember growing up as a kid and shooting baskets in my backyard and the homemade basketball goal for hours at a time. And I never lost a game when I was playing with myself. You know, how you shoot, and you go, oh, oh, he was fouled. Another shot, go to the line. I never lost, right? I don't like to lose, no. Oh, yeah. Um, you talked about working at Accenture and checking the box off when you feel like you're ready to go. Can you kind of elaborate on what you learned there and what made you feel confident in moving on? Yeah, I, I will tell you right now, it is the best learning environment I, I've ever had, right? So um, the training that they give you, the environments they throw at you, the responsibility they throw at you at such an early age um, is fantastic. Uh, and so I learned a ton. And, um, you know, and the reality is that a lot of what they teach you, uh, I, I use today, right? Of breaking big rocks down into little rocks, right? Of making a to-do list and checking it off at the end of the day. But in terms of the check in the box thing, then my comment there was really around, um, I, I worked really hard to make sure I could keep getting to the next step and getting to the next step fairly fast. As Alan reminded me, I'm not patient. Um, and, and so as I got to those next steps, and I got to the step that I could see the next rung on the ladder as a partner, um, and I knew what it would take to get there, and I knew I could do that to get there, that was kind of OK for me. Like, I didn't have to go prove it anymore to myself. I knew I could get there if I stayed around, hung around, did the right things. Um, and so that was kind of um, my box checking for myself. It also taught me that I, I really like to see the ripples in the pond that I make. Because I got to that point and said, geez, I could be partner. I know what it takes. I know how many years it's going to be. Um, but I'm still not sure I'm going to be in control of my own destiny. And I didn't really like that part too much. Because I'd have senior partners who would say, hey, you ought to do this, or you need to go do this. Um, and so I like having that, uh, and maybe it's another weakness, uh, that control of my own destiny of trying to make that path. If that makes any sense at all. Sure. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and my question, I think it's fascinating how much your scenery has changed since where you came from to your college experience and into your professional life. And I know that a lot of the leaders that we've heard from and that we've just experienced in our lives is that they've had figures in their life that have kind of pointed them in right directions, you know, as whether they're model, like where they're, they're really close to them or just people that they really look up to. So where, where do you think you found most of those figures? Um, certainly playing sports coaches. So I had a wonderful high school coach uh, that I spent a, uh, a lot of time with growing up. Um, my first job after Millsaps, as I said, was in the um, admissions office. So I worked for the dean of admissions, a gentleman by the name of John Christmas. Um, and, and Mr. Christmas passed away about three or four years ago. Um, but I remember I was at, uh, and it's a small liberal arts school, right? So when you're graduating, you show up and the professors have you over to the house to have a drink. And back in those days, you could drink at under 21. Um, and, and talk about your future and what you're gonna do. And I had shown up there and I never had met Dean Christmas because I was an athlete and kind of came through a different channel. Uh, he cornered me. And he, this was a man who had uh, played football at LSU, had served in the Army, gotten his degree through a VJ, V812 program uh, at, at, say, at Millsaps. And so he cornered me, Iman, and said, you know, what are you going to do? I said, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Christmas. I, I've got a couple offers here from 
the two banks in town basically and I guess I'll go learn how to be a banker and start out as a teller and that sounds really exciting. <laughs> and he goes, well, why don't you come work for me? I said, well, I, I don't really know what you do. Um, he said, well, what are, you, what are they going to pay you? And he said, um, and I said, they're going to give me $15,000 starting salary. He goes, I'll give you $15,000 starting salary and a car. I go, sold, get done, <laughs> drop the mic, I'm in. I, I don't know what you do, but it sounds better than going being a bank teller. Um, and so he was a wonderful role model for me. Um, he sold an intangible product better than I've ever seen anyone sell it before. Uh, and it was a great thing, even though I didn't get to actually start leading my own sales efforts at Accenture, but I had that experience before watching him do this, watching him work a crowd. And it's somewhat of a complex sale, so, right? so I've got to convince the student that they're interested in my product. Uh, and then I've also got to convince the parents that they're willing to pay for that product. Um, and so he was a great mentor for me. For me. Uh, many, 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 uh, including Al, folks at Accenture who uh, were partners there that I looked up to and I saw and I honestly tried to take the parts that I liked from different ones. Uh, they're not all great. There were ones that I didn't like. There were ones I didn't get along with. Um, but many and most were. And I loved uh, that kind of uh, leadership and, and the amount of time they're willing to spend with people if they saw that you were willing to commit as well to do that. Um, and then my partners that we started Clarkston with. You know, we were all kind of the same age and same experiences, uh, but we had different strengths and weaknesses that we brought to the table. Uh, and we got along fabulously, uh, for the most part. Um, we've had our issues over the years. Can't do that, be in business for 20 years without having them. Uh, but two of those folks are still on my board today. Okay. Thank you for that long part. Yes, I have. Uh, I'd actually, I'd like to talk about RSI. For okay. The past, for at least a couple of decades, we were doing consulting with Clarkson and with Accenture. And uh, moving over to RSI, uh, you have this like technical group that you're that you have a development center across the country. Um, would you say that RSI is more focused on consulting or on technical work? On technical work. So, so we we do. Um, Java development, OpenStack development, uh, we build business applications, enterprise applications, we do .NET, SharePoint work. We do some off-the-shelf application work, support around SAP, Salesforce.com, some others as well. Okay. I'm the last question. Terry, okay. Uh, Millsaps has an incredible brand, you know, uh, especially going back to the civil rights uh, era and what it did this with This is 50 uh, year anniversary the of them first um, admitting uh, African Americans into the college, 1965, way before any other public institution did it. Very, very cool school. <coughs> anyway, uh, my question, uh, since I don't know coding and stuff like that is... Neither um, do I, obviously. <laughs> Uh, what kinds of knowledge and competencies do you hire for, especially um, out of school for the variety of jobs that you might hire for? And secondarily, given the cost effectiveness that's necessary for your model, how do you uh, ass develop or assure that your employees maintain their um, competencies sure. uh, over, over time in a changing world? Yeah, so um, we, we look for folks who Largely in the past, it was pretty easy. We came out with a computer science degree. There are a certain number of schools in these locations that we partner very closely with. Um, but we also do a lot of um, quality assurance, QA work around that software now. There are no degrees in QA software programming these days. Uh, but the, one of the things that we're talking about with some of the colleges where we do have these relationships is to put that kind of curriculum in. Uh, but in terms of raw skills, people who are general problem solvers, uh, people who can uh, focus for long periods of time, that's not a strength of mine either. Um, and who uh, can understand business concepts and turn those into technical programs. Um, we, we hire people and we no longer require a college degree uh, for entry. We really want to hire for the capabilities, not for the sheepskin. Um, and one of the things that I've been a proponent of for many years, or several years now, in getting some of our folks to, in our communities to try to get on board with, uh, is the di idea of coding camps, right? Um, so a person who knows this is what they want to do, they want to be a software programmer, they want to get into that field, they may not have the means to go to a four-year school to go through all the requirements to get there. Coding academies 
let you do that in an immersion program over a, typically a 12-week period of time. It also allows you to come out without a lot of debt. And many of the people that we work with and hire um, are first-generation college graduates who uh, put themselves through school. Uh, so it's not always easy for them to afford the tuition and the other things associated with the four years. Uh, in many cases, they aren't all that interested in the requirements to get to where I really actually take the courses that I want to get to. Um, we have a very robust internship program, and so we have begun to get some of the questions of students working for us who say, hey, I'm learning more here working for you part-time than I am in class. What should I do? I defer on those questions to the, the family. You need to take that offline. Um, but in terms of continuing to keep those skills sharp, which is critical, um, we invest a lot in ongoing training uh, and an apprenticeship model. So in or, for instance, in order to get into the Salesforce.com world, we went out and hired experienced people who have Salesforce.com um, 10, 12 years of experience. And then we'll bring in <coughs> relatively young, new Java programmers to learn the Force.com platform, to tutor under them, to learn under them. Um, and then within a short period of time, they pick it up like nothing. It's just another language for them. Um, and so we will always invest in people's keeping their skills sharp because that's what our clients are asking for as they move up the technology curves. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.